How much, how much would you say that your life has in common uh, with, with a widow? And especially maybe a, a widow of the past before uh, Social Security and, and various savings of different kinds. Uh, there's a widow like that in, in Luke chapter 18 in, in the parable that Jesus spoke. Some parables you read and you have to gauge kind of by the context who Jesus is speaking to and what you know about the people he's talking to to get an idea of what the application of the parable is. This one is not like that. This one's really, really simple because the first thing Jesus says is, here's what the parable is about. And so you, you, you know what to look for as you're going through the parable. So Luke 18 <laughs> verse 1, he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And if you want a title for the lesson tonight, that, that would be it. Pray always, do not lose heart. So then let's read the parable, verses 2 through 5. And that, that's what you're looking for is, what, what in this parable, what would this have to do with prayer? And those who ask and those who are asked. So read with me verses 2 through 5. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So why is the widow coming to the judge? Uh, maybe if she weren't a widow, maybe if she had a husband, somebody she could depend upon, or if she herself had the strength or the money, or otherwise the, the ability, she could just take care of the problem herself. And wouldn't we all just rather take care of the problem ourselves instead of having to ask somebody else and, and waiting for them and hoping that they care enough to do it, and that if they care enough to do it, they have the ability to do it. But she didn't have any of that. And so she appeals to this judge. So this is teaching us about pray always and do not lose heart. So is Jesus' point that God is just like this judge? Because isn't that usually the way a parable goes? That there's you know, a leader, and then there's rebellious servants, and, and God is usually the one in charge in parables. Is that the case here? Is, is Jesus saying, well, God is just like this judge, so if you just bother God enough, eventually He'll get tired of listening to you, and then He'll just give in and give you what you want. I think we can all see, see past that. that. That's not what Jesus is saying. And so go with me verses, to verses 6 and 7, where Jesus gives, as He sometimes does, an explanation of the parable. And then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge His own elect, who cry out day and night to Him, though He bears long with them? So of course, Jesus' point is not, uh, that God is like the unjust judge, but God is like this judge and that at least God listens. Uh, this judge at, at least did that maybe just to collect the check or whatever he, whatever he received from listening, but he did listen. And God also answers. And even though this judge cared nothing for the, the plaintiff, uh, does not share that in common with God, but at least he did answer. And so God has that in common. And Jesus points out that God, God certainly will avenge. In, in verse 7, God will avenge. And in particular, when He hears His elect, when He hears His people cry out. Think about, uh, in the, if, if you can relate in any way, uh, the intensity of a widow who is, has reached, her, uh, reached the point where she has no other options. And so she's, she's desperate. And so she cries out for help. Uh, cry, cry out. This is what Jesus did uh, before he, he took his last breath in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. So there's a request like, well, please, could I have? But then there's, there's a cry out. There's an appeal because of the depth of the need. And so the elect cry out to God. They cry out day and night. So we might say this is more than some of the even things Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Do you, do you cry out day and night for that? Well, maybe not, because 
you thank God for it and you know that you need it, but maybe you also have a pantry full of food, so maybe you're not crying out like you would if, if the pantry was in, empty and you were wondering about where your food was going to come from tomorrow. So there are things that we pray for, but those are not always the things that we cry out for day and night, uh, an appeal of that sort and that nature. And then notice what also is said about them, the end of verse 7, that Jesus says, God will avenge, but how quickly will He avenge? Well, there's some amount of time where He forbears what? Long with them. He, he will avenge the, the request, the, the intense, sincere request of His saints, but He's not going to do it immediately. He will bear long with them. He doesn't ignore them. Uh, he is with them through the struggle. Now, that's another contrast to the unjust, unjust judge. He offered the, the widow no help while he made her wait. She, she just had to keep coming back and didn't know what to expect. She had to go away and wait. Nothing happened. She comes back. And so he, he offered her nothing in the meantime. He was selfish. And while he was selfish, she was alone. But the contrast with that is that while God waits at times before he solves the problem or gives justice, uh, he, he doesn't leave those alone who ask for help. He, he waits with them. And while His people wait for help, well, why, why does God not wait? Why doesn't He just bring justice, solve the problem, and do it quickly, and then everybody would feel a whole lot better? Well, I can't answer every circumstance, but what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 when He taught us to ask and to seek and to knock, and He said, you'll, you'll receive, you'll find, and there will be an answer but in verse 11, you remember that Jesus said, if, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, uh, your father, father also knows how to give good gifts to those who ask them. He, he knows what to give, and He knows when to give it. And so when God is, is bearing long with them, in other words, they're crying out, they're asking for something, and He's not giving it yet, why doesn't He give it yet? It's... It's for somebody's good. It's not like the unjust judge that he, he could, he just doesn't want to. It's that he's waiting, and he waits for the good, often of the one who's asking, but sometimes there's more than one people, more than one person involved. And it's for the good of all who are involved that he waits. But again, think about the difference. If the judge had told the widow the very first time, I will get justice for you, but I, I, I can't... It can't be solved today. That the, the wheels of justice, as they say, sometimes move slow. And so if he had promised her, I will get justice, but I can't do it today, but you, you're not going to be alone. Whatever needs you have, we're, we're going, we're, I'll get you through this. We'll, we'll get you through this. What do you need? And until this can be solved, I, I, I will be with you. Now, the widow would be in a very different place. She's still having to wait for justice, but she has someone waiting with her in the meantime. Do you think she would have, have been able much more easily to wait with that kind of assurance that her waiting would end and in the meantime, the judge was with her? And of course, that fits much more precisely God's promise. And then, finish this section with verse 8. Jesus says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find face, faith on the earth? So, He will avenge them speedily. That doesn't mean He will immediately grant the request and solve the problem. But when it's time for justice to come, when it's the right time to do it, then He'll do it and He will not wait. One of the uh, things that, we, that Taylor read from Proverbs is that when justice is delayed, then that has, has an effect. Well, God knows the right time. God doesn't delay unnecessarily or in a way that, that weakens, uh, weakens justice in, in any way. And so when it's time to bring justice, it will be decisive. But then there's the last question. So God, God will 
bear with them. God will avenge. And when He does, it will be quick. But in the meantime, the transition word there is nevertheless. In other words, that, that will be taken care of. But Jesus has one more thing to say. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he really find faith on the earth? Now the easy answer is, well, of course. When he comes back, there will be somebody. Uh, there will be faith in, in somebody somewhere on the earth. Sure, sure that would happen. But then the more challenging part is, well, what, what if that was, was today? What if this day doesn't end? What if Jesus returns today? Will, will he find faith on the earth? Probably easy to say yes. Uh, the challenging question is, well, but what about in you? Will he, will he really find faith in you? Well, we can measure that maybe in, in a variety of ways, but part of the way that Jesus is saying, uh, the Son of Man will find faith if when he returns, his people have prayed always and have not lost heart. So our faith is partly determined on our habits in prayer. Part of the challenge of, of our habits in prayer is that God didn't command every detail about prayer to us. What I mean is, well, how many, how many times, what's the bare minimum number of times you have to pray in a 12-hour period, in a 24-hour, in a 36-hour period? Um, God didn't give a number. Uh, what about how long do I need to pray? Or how many of those prayers need to be more than uh, 95 seconds? God didn't say. Uh, how, how many people do I need to include beside myself in, in each prayer? Uh, what about my posture? Should I look up to God as I speak to Him? Should I always bow? Should I do one or the other on standing, sitting, on my knees, all the way on the... Well, God, God didn't say, so no wrong answer there. Uh, what percentage of my prayer needs to be praise? What percentage needs to be a request for myself? What percentage a request for others? What percentage needs to be giving thanks? You get the point. So God has this expectation about prayer, and God judges whether there is faith on the earth and faith in me, in part based upon my habit in prayer. And yet, a, a lot of the specifics about what God expects, He he leaves that to, to your judgment for you and, and my judgment for mine. And yet he makes it clear that faith and prayer are inseparable. And so, what does God say about your faith? Well, one way that God is going to, to measure your faith and answer whether there is really faith in you and me is by our habits in prayer. That's going to be an essential part of finishing up 20, 2022 as we measure it and beginning 2023. In this, the remainder of this year and in the next year, if God gives it, <clears throat> you are going to need to pray, to pray always. And then there are also going to be challenges, things that will make that difficult in some way. And so you will have to not lose heart. So how do I know? We all know that that we, we need to pray. How do we know that there will be challenges, though, to praying always and not losing heart? Well, we could know that by looking at whatever part of human history we, we want to, whether it's in the Bible or in man's record of human history or in whatever part of human history you've observed. And because of the wickedness of man, because of, of the sin of others or of myself, uh, one way or another, my life and your life is going to be harder this, the remainder of this year and the, into the coming year because of sin. Whether it's because of the sinful decisions of other people, and that makes your life harder, or your own sin of the past or the present making your life harder. Sin is going to, to provide challenges. Also, by my, my few uh, my mere 46 years of life on this earth. Uh, that's presented just a, a little sample for me to know of there is a need for prayer and there are challenges to persistence in our prayer. But more so, I, I, I won't read it, but if, if you want to turn to Ecclesiastes 3, the, 
the things that Solomon says there, that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And he talks about the beginning and the end as he goes into that, that fairly well-known list of things. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And if you just glance over that and, and just let your eyes maybe walk through that passage, you'll see some things that you'll recognize are just a typical part of living on this earth. Just like seasons come and seasons go, well, that, that's a, uh, Solomon gives a summary of the things that are going to happen on this earth that we hope for and that we hope against. And what are the seasons that he describes there? Again, just pick out two or three as you skim down through that. Is there anything that you can say in that list that in, in 2023, I, I don't think I'll have any problem that, that that season will not come to my life in this upcoming year for about 365 days. You, you can't know that. Whether, whether it's things you, you hope for or, or hope against, uh, because of the uncertainty of life and yet the certainty of what will come within, within some general boundaries, uh, that's how I know that we will need to pray because in this coming year, uh, there will be a time to be born and there will be a time to die and those will touch all of us maybe in, in different ways but, and maybe even in ways that we do not expect. But the time to be born means I need to pray and the time to die means I will need to pray and both also mean that there will be challenges and along aside those two times, everything else that he says there so I suppose and I hope that in this coming year, there will be some things for you that will go well. If you, again, look through the things that Solomon says, there could be some things there you say, well, yeah, I hope this year there will be the time to fill in the blank. There are just things that are naturally more appealing to us, about half of those things that Solomon says. And so hopefully, uh, as we go through this coming year, there will be things of that sort. Uh, things that we hope for, things that maybe we have planned for, or things that happen that we're glad that happened that we didn't even plan for. Well, the occasions of prosperity or joy that Solomon describes, uh, those are reasons that we will need to pray. And those are also reasons that prayer will be a challenge. Now, that's not often as obvious because, well, if things are going well, uh, we it, it's easy to think my... My desperation or my need for prayer is, is not as deep as in the other occasions. But that's exactly what makes uh, prayer a challenge when things are going well. Because when it's the, the time to be born and it's the time to gain and it's the time to keep and it's the time to build and it's the time for peace and it's the time for love, well then it's easy to think, I, I don't have really anything to ask for. And... We are mistaken if we think, because I have nothing to ask for, then I have nothing to pray about. But that can make it a challenge. If I'm not just content, but if I'm deceived because of what I have, then prayer will be a challenge. We can be so busy enjoying life that we can totally forget God. Or maybe that would be a stretch for you at this phase of your life. But we can so enjoy what we have that we forget to thank God. That can absolutely happen. And Jesus talked about that rich fool in Luke chapter 12. Uh, your soul will be required of you this very night. Uh, prayer can be a challenge when things are going well because what's going well might distract us from some problem. And so we may, not, we may be totally blind to something that needs our attention because we're so focused, we're so attentive to the things that are going well and that we like and that we enjoy and in that case the lack or the absence of prayer can be a part of helping us fail to see a problem that is there and that, that may be a problem in our own life it may be a problem in other people's lives and so we're so wrapped up in the prosperity and the easy and the contentment or the joy that we we don't notice, and maybe we don't even know that there's somebody else is in the opposite season and, and they're wrestling with 
things that uh, necessitate our help, but we're too busy to notice or we're, per- too, we're too busy to help. That means there's a challenge uh, to persistent prayer in my life if I'm not noticing others. The other side of that is also true, that I suppose, I hope not, uh, but there are just things in the course of life that you can look back at this year or the past few years, and you can go down through Ecclesiastes 3 and say, yeah, I remember this was the time for something I, I didn't want, didn't ask for, didn't hope for, but it came. And if we can look at the past and recognize that, then we can see the benefit in the parable that Jesus gave, that I, I needed to be praying and I needed to be constantly praying and I needed to, to not lose heart and prayer is a part of helping that to happen. But when things do not go well, then prayer can also be a challenge. We may be so devastated by grief in some area of our life that we can, we can think of, of nothing else. And especially the tra- tragedies that come that are, are not expected or anticipated without any warning. They, they can consume us in our own grief or there's someone else we care about, we love, and we are consumed by their grief in in genuine love for them. But is it possible to be so consumed with our own grief or that of others that we forget to ask for God's help? Grief uh, sometimes reminds us that we need God's help, but some people it consumes them so much that prayer becomes a challenge. We can also make the mistake of thinking that God doesn't care or that prayer doesn't help because I I asked, like that widow, well, I went to the judge and asked, asked sincerely, and the the request was not granted, and so I, I need to find another solution. Maybe we are so busy watching others who don't share the same problems that we are consumed by jealousy or anger or bitterness in some way and it, it's hard to persistently pray when we, we know that we carry those kinds of things actively in, in our mind. We can also be distracted from the blessings that we do have. And so prayer be- becomes a challenge. Uh, we again, are, are so focused on the problems that we overlook the fact that, that typically, even going, going back through Ecclesiastes 3, it, it's not always the case that just one of the things that Solomon says is happening and it's only that happening. There's many times we're going through several of the things that he says, both the ones we enjoy and the ones that we do not. But sometimes when it's the time to tear down or it's the time to die or there's the time for, for war, uh, we don't notice the, the occasions of gain and of love and of peace that are available. We don't notice those because of the eff- effect and the influence of others. And so that's how we can all know in the remainder of this year and in whatever part of the future that that God gives us that the necessity of learning the lesson that Jesus said we we will need whether things are well or not well to pray always and not lose heart. With those things in mind then go to Philippians chapter 4. Keep Luke chapter 18 in your mind, uh, maybe even some things from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And then let's read Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and, and go through these verses as we did Luke chapter 18. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious in nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so somebody took this song and and made it into, or took this verse and made it into a song. We sometimes teach, teach our children. I have the joy down in my heart, joy being one of the themes of the book of Philippians. And I have the love of Jesus and the peace that passes all understanding, which I still remember to this day singing that song and not having any idea what, what that meant. The peace that passes understanding. I like sports. So when I heard the word passes, I, I went to a football. And so I didn't, didn't catch that song until I lived a few more 
the meaning of that song till I, I lived a few more years. Verse 6, though, be, be anxious for nothing. If, if we make the mistake of lifting this phrase out from the Bible and setting it by itself, well, the Bible says, Thou shalt not be anxious. And so if you're worried about something, then that's, that's sinful, and you just haven't been praying enough, and you don't trust God enough. Is, is that what he's saying here? Well, it, is it sinful to be exceedingly sorrowful, to, to be in agony, to, to be troubled? Because those are the ways that Jesus is described in the garden uh, the night that he was going to be betrayed. Matthew and Mark describe him there as being exceedingly sorrowful. Matthew 26 and verse 38. Luke tells us of the same occasion, he was in agony. Luke chapter 22 and verse 44 and then John, John tells us that he was troubled. So Jesus could be in agony and troubled. Uh, that, that would mean, I think would pretty much be synonymous with what Paul speaks of here. Jesus could experience all of those things, but he certainly did not sin. And in fact, Jesus wasn't even growing weaker when he was there in the garden in agony and exceedingly sorrowful. In fact... Uh, that was an occasion where, I don't know that would say Jesus grew stronger necessarily, but where his strength was, was demonstrated before the disciples, and, and as we read about, read about that still today. And so Jesus could experience all of those, and so can we. We can experience extreme sorrow, exceeding sorrow, and be in agony, and be greatly troubled, but... If, if our faith is stronger than our uncertainty and our worry and our concern, then we can do exactly what Paul says here and exactly what Jesus did. And the result of that is, while Jesus was not growing in, in strength and spiritual maturity, we can and we will. So how do we do that? How is it that we're anxious in nothing? Well, the contrast is, and you can see kind of the word, the word play there, be anxious in nothing... But what, what's on the other side of the ledger? Well, in everything, in everything, let your requests be made known to God. By prayer, let your requests be made known to God. And that's exactly what, what Jesus did, didn't he? When he was anxious, when he was exceedingly sorrow, when he was in agony, then this applies exactly what he did. Then by prayer and supplication, he let his requests be made known to God. What was his request on that occasion? Uh, we, we may not, not have ever used that phrase, but we've prayed the same thing. Let this cup pass from me. But how, how did he end that prayer? The same way we hear some prayers here. Not my will, but your will be done. Can, can you uh, make yourself... Uh, with some degree of confidence in it. Can, can you say that, like that persistent widow, uh, when you're crying out is something you, you are compelled to pray about more than once a day, and with some degree of intensity, can you make your request, and then in, end it by saying, but if what I'm asking for isn't best, then I, I trust you, God, more than I trust me. Because there's, there's nothing miraculous. Jesus certainly did many miraculous things, I don't know of anything miraculous connected to Jesus' prayer there in Gethsemane. Uh, I believe everything that Jesus did there, uh, you can do and I can do, and everything we know about the circumstances and what had happened that night and was about to happen and then was going to happen, uh, I think we would all agree we, we're not facing, we're not going to face anything quite a, of that magnitude. And so if he could do that in those circumstances, is there any heartache, any, any sorrow, any agony in which we could conscientiously say, well, that worked for Jesus, but in my circumstance, that, uh, that, that prayer and supplication is, just doesn't apply in, this, in my circumstance. Who's, who's benefit, for whose benefit is this instruction given? And, and any other, and even back to Luke chapter 18, that we, that we ask, especially in response to 
the strains of this of this life. Of course, of course, it's not for God's benefit, because He He knows our request, what it's going to be before we would we would even express it. But what God is training us to do is what Jesus taught again in Matthew chapter seven that it's important that you humble yourself and that you make time out of all that's going on, whether it's good or not good in your, in your opinion, that you make time to, to ask and that you make time to seek and that you knock. That's, that's for our benefit. Just like parents, we teach our children, well, if, if you ask, if you ask the right way, then you can. But until you ask, and until you ask the right way, uh, it's for your benefit that, that I withhold some things even if I know you, you really, really want them. That's, that's part of what God is doing. Uh, God is training us when He tells us to, not, to be anxious in nothing but in everything, let your requests be made known. But then, of course, I didn't finish that phrase. Let your requests be made known. Those, that next part is really important. Let your request be made known with thanksgiving. Every time you ask for something, especially when you're in the context of maybe not a habitual prayer, but a prayer that's in response to some circumstance, uh, but every time that you ask, be sure you also give thanks. Uh, the, the wisdom of that, I, I think, is obvious. Whether we or in some occasion, on some occasion of asking, well, then we're also going to give thanks. Uh, that could be we're giving thanks because we think about, well, I'm making this request, but you know, this isn't the first request I've ever made. And I can think of some other request I made, and God answered that. And so when I'm making a new request, it's appropriate I go back and review God's history in, in my life. And so I make this request, but I make it with thanksgiving for the the help He's already provided. It could also be that we thank God for answering this request before He has answered this request. Could you do that? Before God, before you know what God's answer is. That's, that's in essence what the statement is, not my will, but your will be done is. It's, I, I know that you know and I trust you more than I trust me. And so thank you, God, for hearing my request. And I know you will answer my request. And that's, that's really all that I need to know. Or maybe there's other areas in which we can make a request with thanksgiving. But with this instruction, as is the case in most, if not all, of God's instruction, there's, there's a promise, there's a gift, there's a blessing connected to it. Not that we earn it, not that it's a trade-off, uh, but that... That that's the nature of God's promises, that if we make our request with thanksgiving, then verse 7, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And I'll fill in that part that I skipped over in just a minute. But here's, here's what he says. Instead of being anxious, if you'll make your request with thanksgiving, then the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. Let's think about guarding. How do you, how do you guard a house? Uh, you could put up a really tall fence and so nothing can get in. Uh, you can hire somebody that you've always got somebody on the premises, on the property, always watching, always active, aware. You can trust them. You can guard a house that way. Uh, what about a person, though? How do you guard not just something, but how, how might you guard and protect uh, someone that you, that you love? Well, you... Whether you're right by their side or you might be at a little bit of a distance, you can see them. Maybe they can't see you, but you can see them. You watch them. You stay with them. You can even guard someone if they're willing to listen by, by what you tell them, by what you teach them. If you give them the knowledge and the, train them in the skills that they, that they need, well, then even if you're not with them, if, if they know what they need to know and you've shared that with them, you, you are contributing to their help and their safety. That can certainly be a way that we could guard someone. And so how, how does God guard us? Well, 
the, the easy, or, or the, maybe what we wish was, it would be like we would guard a house. That God would just put that high fence up around us so that nothing could get in, and if it got past the fence, well then there's the moat with the, the crocodiles all in it, and so there's just no way that anyone or anything is going to get to the house. But we know better if we've read the book of Job. If we've read the book of Psalms, as we are reading the book of Ecclesiastes, we see that's, that's not how God guards us. Uh, last Sunday evening, we looked at the promise that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 28. I will be with you always. We studied in, in detail what, what that means and about God being with us, God abiding with us. God being in us, God abiding in us, dwelling in us, and we with Him. Is there anything in that that has anything to do with the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds? One of the ways that God is with us for certain is by the truth that He teaches us. And we, we might forget the, the peace that truth brings temporarily until somebody lies, lies to us. And so then when, uh, when, when we're lied to and that causes the turmoil and the distrust and the, the chaos and the complications of having to unravel and unwind well, what is the truth and trying to, to sort that out, well, then that's a reminder to us. Uh, there, there is a peace that comes when I'm told the truth, when I know the truth, and people around me act, cons act consistent with the truth. That may not make everything just, just perfect, but it, it sure brings a lot of peace when the truth is told. And so think about the truth that God shares with us in, in this context of when we pray with thanksgiving, when, when I know the truth of who I can ask, because we've all asked the wrong people sometimes for help with a car or, or something that was over our head, we had to trust them, and we, we trusted the wrong person. On well, the other side of that, when we know the truth about who we can trust and who we can trust to care and who we can trust to listen and who we can trust to be able to provide and who we can thank, well, then now, again, the problems don't go away. But if I have somebody like that that I can speak to in the circumstance of Philippians chapter 4, then there, there's some relief. I can't, fix, I can't fix my vehicle, but okay, it's in the hands of somebody I, I can trust, and I'll do what they tell me to do. Okay, that, that's off my mind, off my board, and I can go back and, and pay, pay more attention to other things. And, and so it is with God. When I, when I know the truth of who I can ask and who will hear, and also, when then I, I accept the truths that He has told me about, the occasions that bring this, uh, this anxiety, uh, the, the problems, again, back to Ecclesiastes 3, the, the half of those things that we wish would never happen, but they do. Well, when I know the truth that those problems are temporary, that's a part of what Ecclesiastes, the whole book, and especially chapter 3, is about. Uh, the, the season of being born and die and gain and lose and build up and tear down, it, it's going to come, but it's also going to go. All of those things are temporary. So when I know the truth about that, well then, even if that problem lasts for the rest of my life, well, my life is temporary. There, there is, a, is a boundary to that problem. And so when I know the truth about problems, that guards my mind. When I know the truth, turn to Romans chapter 8. When I know this truth, and before I state it, just let me, let me read it, let's, or let's read it together. But think about the truth we read here and how this will guard our heart and mind. Paul says, you, you might know something about the, the seasons or the problems that Paul faced from time to time. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. As is prayed here from time to time, thank you God for the cold so that we can appreciate the warm. Uh, in a sense, that, that's what he's saying on a different level. Uh, Paul says, well, the things that I suffer here, they, they, as bad as they are, 
the, the flip side of that in degree is, is even greater. And so it, it, it can be bad. And in one sense, as Jesus said, fear not him that can kill the body, but can kill, destroy both body and soul in hell. When it's bad, it can get worse. But the point of Paul here is that when I know the truth, that the sorrow of the problems of this life don't, can't even be compared to the joy and the blessings of the glory that God has promised to man in Christ. Well, then there is a peace that guards my mind and my heart. And then one other, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul wrote about the, the thorn in the flesh, uh, when I, I know the truth that God has a plan, that when I'm weak in one way, then God has a way to make me strong in a different way. So that when I'm weak, then I am strong. If, if I can remember that, when I'm very aware of my weakness or the weakness of others that's causing me some strain, if I can remember God can make me strong, though I am weak, there's something that guards, then the peace of God will guard your hearts and mind. And minds. Well, again, back in Philippians 4, as I did a few minutes ago, intentionally, I skipped over one phrase, though. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. But this is that phrase, the peace of God which passes understanding, which surpasses understanding, which is superior to understanding. Now, to, to, to people without faith, this is just trite. This is just blind faith. Oh, you don't know what to believe, so you're just going to believe something, so you just say, okay, God will take care of it. And so they, they claim that's just a, a blind, mindless faith. But that's not what Paul's talking about. Because he's talking about trusting someone that we do know. And we know that one because of, of what God has said and what God has done. There's the layer of evidence upon which our, our trust and our faith and our confidence is built. And with that foundation, well then, in that case, there are occasions where I might feel like I would have some relief if I understood. But there's something better than understanding. Because if you've lived long enough, you know when you understand one thing, all you do is find out how much you don't know. Or you find out some, a little bit, and then you just want to know more. So there's something better than understanding. And that is confidence that God understands. And when I know He understands, and He knows it better than I do, and He knows it before I do, well then, trusting Him with it, is better than waiting for the, the solution or feeling like I'll, I'll unravel it all and figure it out on my own. Well, why can I have the peace of God that I can accept? That peace is better than having the answers, understanding why or when or how long and how. Well, that's the last thing that Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This confidence that the peace of God, uh, that I'll have the peace of God if I make my request with thanksgiving, is, is built upon Christ Jesus. We talked and looked at this morning about Christ and, and the word Christian. Well, what, what's that? Why is Christ that foundation? Well, it's because John 1 verse 1, when I know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, when, when I have learned about Jesus' existence before He ever came to this earth, well, that gives Him a pretty good bit of credibility. My, my confidence in what I know about Jesus before there was a heaven or, the earth, or an earth, because He is God. That's a layer of this, of this peace. And then turn to the book of Hebrews, two more passages before we conclude our study. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Hebrews 2, verse 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those 
who are tempted. And so here are the things that we not only know about Jesus before this earth existed and before he came, but also the things that we know about Christ Jesus in the time that he spent on this earth. That's a layer. That, that's a part of our confidence that surpasses understanding, that gives us this peace of God. Because I know Jesus was here, and that in whatever way I, I suffer or I'm tempted, that there's something comparable in the things that Jesus experienced on this earth. That, that builds my confidence. And so as, we, as I noted earlier, of Jesus' prayer in the garden, that's a part of what aids those who are tempted. And then over a page in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it's not only what I can know about Christ Jesus before there was a heavens or the earth, or what I can know about Jesus in His time in these heavens and this earth, it's also what I know about Jesus at, at this very moment. Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so it's not just the historical Jesus, but it's also that Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, at, at the throne, and we can go there, and there is sufficient grace, there is sufficient mercy, there is everything that we need for every occasion. And certainly the occasions of which Paul is writing in Philippians chapter 4. So when you know and are convinced of the first principles of Jesus in heaven before there was any heavens and earth. And of Jesus leaving, the, leaving heaven and coming to this earth and then leaving this earth and returning to heaven. If, if you, you know that story and you know those instructions and you know those promises, then what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 can fully persuade us. We today have access to the God of peace and to the peace of God. And so then we can finish where we started in Luke chapter 18. That if I know, if I have confidence that I have access to the peace of God and to the God of peace, then it's not hard to understand that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. During your song books number 331, do you know this Jesus, and do you know this God, and do you know this peace? And what Jesus has said will, will help us to know and to grow in, in these things. Pray always, and then you will better know this God, and this Jesus, and this peace. If you're the kind that does New Year's resolutions, then uh, don't wait till January 31st, or, or December 31st, or January 1st. Uh, make an early one tonight that you will pray always and not lose heart. As we sing this song, if you know that your sin is one reason, you don't pray always. That you have a reason to doubt, not that God is aware of what you say. He, he knows when anyone is praying, but if you have reason to doubt that God accepts the things that, that you ask and that you pray, then we sing this song to urge you that before you would pray, uh, then that you would seek the, the promises and the instructions that God has given. If you're ready to confess your own faith that Jesus is the Christ, if you're willing to confess that faith and to repent of your sins, then be baptized with that Christ, baptized into that Christ. If you'll be baptized into Him by faith in the working of God, then He'll wash away your sins, and then you can pray in a way that you have not been able to pray in a long time. If you need to repent as a Christian and, and pray and ask for forgiveness or if we can encourage or help you in any way, come forward tell us how we could help you as we stand and sing.